Well, thanks, John. Thanks for the introduction. And it's so good to see so many here uh, this afternoon uh, and also so many good friends from times past. Um, I'd like to thank uh, John and his staff for making the current strategy forum possible. I uh, thank all of us who have any dealings whatsoever with uh, symposiums, fora, uh, realize that there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. So John, thanks for, for all that you did and that of your, your staff. You know, I normally uh, come to the current strategy forum and stay for the duration because I really uh, do get a lot out of just listening to the great speakers, the great panelists. Uh, the questions, uh, quite frankly, are some of the most insightful uh, that, uh, that I receive. So uh, I, I do like to stay for the course, but uh, regrettably, uh, there's some things going on back in Washington. And uh, uh, it's always good to be around the table, particularly when they're talking about your budget. Uh, I like to do that. <laughs> Uh, and then I'm off for some international travel here, but uh, I know it's going to be a great, great session. And again, I thank you all for coming. Uh, it really is a pleasure for me to return again uh, to the Naval War College, uh, the term that I use, the Navy's home of thought, um, in what is uh, my fourth and uh, final current strategy form. Um, I think that it's fitting to come together at times like this to return our focus to something that all uh, seafarers consider fundamental to their daily lives, to their plans and preparations, and indeed to how we see the world. Energy, where we get it from, how we move it, how we use it, indeed how we even reuse it, and how far it takes us in the pursuit of America's objectives is a topic that I think we cannot afford not to engage on. I'd like to thank the Navy's Task Force Energy uh, and the work that they have done since uh, 2008 when we formed that task force uh, as a result of what we saw in record oil prices that gave us a glimpse into the vulnerabilities that are inherent in what I think will be ever rising fuel costs. And I'd like to thank the leadership of that initiative. Uh, some who are here today, Vice Admiral Bill Burke, uh, who leads the, the primary organization under which we've chartered uh, Task Force Energy. Clearly, uh, Rear Admiral Phil Cullum, who I was with this morning in Washington uh, as we recognized our Navy commands for their environmental stewardship. And uh, also, Rear Admiral Dave Tetley, who's our oceanographer of the Navy, who has really changed the discussion and the debate uh, on how we in the Navy and indeed nationally are looking at energy and climate issues. But this discussion that we've had as a result of Task Force Energy and, and uh, uh, Task Force Climate Change has really changed and benefited greatly from, from the Secretary of the Navy's advocacy of energy since he came into office um, a couple of years ago. And I think it's, it's a discussion that continues on today in the context of considerable budget pressure for all facets of government, something that urges awareness and active participation on our part so that we may continue with the aggressive initiatives to which we remain committed and which gain relevance as the scope of this pressure that we're going to face becomes clearer. The Navy's leadership in this discussion is at once a reflection that we perhaps unlike any other service, live in the interplay between natural resources and their global strategic consequences, and also serves to emphasize how considerable those consequences stand to be for a maritime nation that aims to lead through and well beyond the tests we face today. We in the Navy view security through the lens of energy and understand implicitly that our access to energy sources we use today oil and gas primarily, is anything but guaranteed. We're well aware that the supply is not always going to meet demand, and developing trends promise new sources of conflict as they relate to energy. Limited access to fresh water, 
dwindling agricultural yields, overfishing, mass migrations, and climate change will continue to stress the global order just as energy resources become more dear. And this will pull us in several directions when we rather might have more space and time to address America's dependence on imported resources on our own terms. We watch these trends with a sense of urgency because they affect the Navy's energy future, but also because we believe wholeheartedly the future will need our Navy. I spoke here last year of international order as the indispensable factor in global prosperity and peace, and how the Navy serves to guarantee the benefits we derive from a globalized world in which tangible goods, resources, or the electrons that facilitate the exchange of ideas and commerce in a digital age move on the world's oceans. To the extent that those benefits are more prone to disruption and disorder, the uniquely diplomatic and preventive aspects of sea power will come to be better recognized in more nations. More will see that there is good we can and must do from the sea, and that we are thinking anew about how to sustain our contributions globally. As we lay out our potential investments in national security and make decisions affecting the Navy of the future, we must take a realistic view of that future and ensure a dominant fleet continues to provide the foundation for the type of American presence, involvement, and credibility the American people require. With more than 65,000 sailors and about 40% of our Navy deployed globally on any given day, our Navy maintains America's forward presence, engages with partners, and provides offshore options in ways only naval forces do. The Navy's small footprint offshore and flexible range of capabilities gives our nation attractive options to influence events. By assuring, shaping, responding to crisis, and employing force when needed. They allow the United States to remain globally engaged with partners and ensure our access wherever our nation's interests might dwell. While our ships are mobile and able to surge on short notice, it is our persistent forward presence that allows for the speed and flexibility of response the nation has called upon repeatedly over the last two decades, and most recently in Libya and Japan. Off Libya, deployed ships and submarines broke off their patrol and maritime ballistic defense missions to deliver Tomahawk missiles against radar and command and control sites, creating in short order the conditions under which a no-fly zone could be imposed. Off Japan, the deployed Ronald Reagan strike group responded immediately to a natural disaster there with helicopter flights to deliver humanitarian aid and medical capabilities, with nuclear expertise and heavy lift to, to participate in the relief effort. Our recent history, current events, and ongoing operations indicate that the demand for the capability and capacity to respond across the range of possible operations may well increase in coming years. Developments in the broader Middle East are still evolving, where our presence in those seas is so important, and our demonstrated maritime commitment to the nations of the Western Pacific adds stability to the only region where countries with unresolved disputes are building world-class navies. There should be little surprise among this group that our attention is drawn to presence in the crucial sea lanes of these two regions and to the normative and international legal underpinnings of that presence in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. We tend to focus on anti-access and area denial capabilities development, but anti-access practices in the maritime domain are also expanding. Today, some 35 countries claim uh, territorial water type jurisdiction over exclusive economic zones contrary to customary law. And as you might imagine, many of these anti-access practices relate to resource extraction. A new venue for global resource competition is also opening in the Arctic, what we refer to when discussing the impact of climate change as the opening of the fifth ocean, something that hasn't happened since the end of the Ice Age. Efforts are already underway, and not just among the Arctic nations, to seize the economic potential of a region that is estimated by the U.S. Geological Survey 
to contain around 22% of the world's oil and natural gas resource base. Our Navy has been positioned exceedingly well to answer the nation's needs as a joint interagency and international partner in a more networked world. But forward presence requires fuel. Whether we see the new energy options we pursue today to fruition will affect how well we contend with growing operational demand at the same time the sustainability of our force is confronted in new ways. We've been pushing our current fleet hard for the last decade to conduct varied and simultaneous operations on a continuous basis. And the challenges which make this time different for our Navy persist in the form of new fundamentals that we will not be able to address by staying wedded to our past. These new fundamentals in the fields of manpower and procurement and research and development and information technologies will inform what is possible and likely require disruptive change to accommodate. Energy forms a critical element in our response to these realities. From the operating cost reductions we aim for with hybrid electric drives and drop-in fuel alternatives to long-duration shipboard safe unmanned underwater vehicle power that we are currently researching aggressively. Beyond fuel alternatives for total ownership cost reduction, energy access and security considerations have informed the Navy's pursuit of unmanned integration into the fleet we have today and the institutionalization of our Navy's already considerable information dominance capabilities for military competitions that now extend well into the domain of cyberspace. And while not yet upon us, the challenge posed by the widespread surface combatant and submarine retirements of the 2020s will remind us that our nation's shipbuilding industrial base to include second and third tier suppliers and nuclear as well as conventional suppliers must be included as partners in bringing to the fleet the new energy solutions we need to secure America's asymmetric advantages for an uncertain future. While we stand little chance as a single service of making a new energy market in the near term, we have shown the foresight once again to be a motive force in wider technological advancements, to be the early adopters of energy solutions that carry with them the prospects to reimagine the capacity with which we execute the core capabilities of our Navy. This is important because the first and foundational aspect of how America answers, answers its responsibilities and its obligations of international leadership are through sea power. American sea power must remain credible globally as it has been since the late 19th century and dominant as it has been for the last seven decades. And it must assure allies and enduring partners if it is to prevent war. The Secretary of Defense recently reminded an audience of college graduates how many countries seek deep, deeper ties with the United States through our military. How in the midst of some of the most pressing economic challenges and the most important domestic decision points this nation has faced since it assumed the mantle of leadership more countries in the world than ever look to us for leadership than ever before. If we're not to disappoint our friends, not to miss the opportunity that remains to set the international system on a path to greater peace in this century, America must come to terms with, ha with how it will afford the price of responsibility. Will we make the tough decisions to lay bare the prevailing currents of national strategy and apply the resources at hand to our lasting advantage? Or will we try to buy more time to decide and in the process divest the unique American endowments we speak of because none of us remembers a time before we were able to, at will, to advance our interests globally by the dint of presence, access, and dominance at sea. Energy efficiency, energy alternatives, energy independence, as tactical imperatives with the most pervasive strategic implications reside at the heart of how America will afford its future leadership. Navy's direction in the field of energy should serve as yet another indication of where the price of responsibility has been set and what options real energy security tomorrow might unveil with which our great nation might navigate this period of change and challenge 
as successfully as it has in the past. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Yes, sir. Admiral, my, my name is Steve Mercilis from Cape Cod. I have a question about, do you see our country and our Navy more effectively addressing and limiting and controlling the uh, piracy problem around the world, which is, seems to be in, increasing in a major threat to the world? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I see the work that we're doing in the Navy um, in cooperation with several other countries. Uh, to be something that, at least on the horizon, I, I don't see going away until there is some rule of law, particularly in Somalia. I think that what we've done with regard to piracy is pretty extraordinary. When you look at the coalition of countries that have come together, uh, I think many of us in this room six years ago, if you would have said, you know, on any given day, for a period of the last two years, um, I envision the United States, Russia, China, NATO, the EU, Malaysia, India, even Iran, all working together and operating together. I'm not sure anyone, anyone in here would have probably bet their next paycheck on it, but that's what's happening every day. Uh, I think it's important um, to note that there have been other areas around the globe where with an effective maritime scheme and the rule of law ashore, piracy have, has been, uh, been pretty well stamped out, and I, and I cite the Straits of Malacca in particular, and the great work of Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. But I think, you know, when you're patrolling an area four times the size of Texas in the Somali Basin, uh, you have your work cut out for you, even if you do have a lot of friends that are there with you. Yes, sir, in the back. Hold it on. Okay. Bob James, I'm a businessman in New York. Uh, the problem is uh, energy security, and uh, we get uh, the United States has 100% of its own natural gas, 100% of its own coal. We do 50% of our own crude, 16% uh, in addition uh, of our crude comes from uh, Canada and Mexico. That makes, uh, we have two thirds of all our crude comes in. So uh, my problem is this, uh, do, do we really have uh, an energy security problem? And uh, in view of the fact that we have all this close to us, we get very little oil from, uh, from uh, PG, as you know. But then I have an even tougher question. Uh, if we do have a security problem, is uh, uh, forward-based uh, 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 Navy, Army, everything all over the world, is that really the answer? I think the key, and I'll speak for the Navy in particular, that um, as we look at the energy demands and, and, and the costs uh, that are associated uh, with our energy usage, um, it's a significant component of what I worry about every day. Um, when I see the price of oil uh, increase a dollar, uh, I do, I don't even calculate it anymore. When I see a dollar of an increase in the price of oil, it's $33 million to me um, because that's how much I use. So as the, as the energy sources, as the, the flow of, of that resource is affected and prices are affected, it, it does have an effect uh, on how we operate. I would submit that even though we don't draw a lot from the Middle East or even the Gulf of Guinea. In fact, uh, we pull more from the Gulf of Guinea than we do from the Middle East. That still has an effect on friends and partners and how that oil moves is really the lubricant 
in my mind, of, of the global economy. And so I think it does matter that we are in places that can assure uh, that flow. I would submit, um, and I know we have uh, one of my retired colleagues who commanded our fifth fleet in the Middle East, uh, that if we were not present in the Gulf, in the North Arabian Sea, in the approaches uh, to the Red Sea and to the Straits of Malacca, I'm not so sure that the global confidence would be what it is today. Our presence there does so much to calm the waters, if you will, and, and that comes with being forward deployed. Uh, the presence of the Navy is key. You know, we are a deployed force. I talked about the forces that were brought into play in Libya and when we responded to Japan. We didn't sail those from home waters. They were present. Uh, I'm often complimented on behalf of, of our Navy how fast we are, and we are. Uh, our sailors can respond to a crisis in ways that, that you know, defy reason. Uh, but the fact that they can move so quickly is because they're always there. And I think that that gives our nation, that gives our friends and partners options that we wouldn't otherwise have. And so uh, when we talk about the need for presence, I'm always struck that um, it, it's a good exercise to think about world events if we weren't where we are and how they would play out differently. Yes, sir. Uh, Admiral uh, Jeff Gilmore from Calgary. Uh, you mentioned uh, the changing conditions in the Arctic uh, with the uh, decreasing ice and uh, possibly increased traffic. Uh, how will that affect your operational capability for your Navy? Yeah, the way that we're looking at this, and uh, I don't know, is Dave going to be on a panel? Dave Titley going to be on a panel later on? Um, the, the way that we're, we see things developing, uh, and I'm pleased to say that my Canadian counterpart and I have had some good discussions on, on the Arctic, very productive uh, discussions. Um, there's no, no, no question in our mind that um, that the Arctic is changing. You know, we could probably have a healthy debate in the room as to why, but all I know is that there's less ice and more water than there used to be. Um, as I often say, uh, for a Navy guy, more water is always a good thing. So, we, uh, <laughs> but um, we see it evolving over time. I think the first thing that we'll see are the fishing stocks that will begin to migrate farther north as they move with the colder water. The, um, then you'll, you'll have, um, you know, uh, ecotourism will pick up and the, and the unfortunate circumstances that can sometimes befall uh, a group and then how do you do search and rescue in the, in the high north. I think those are the types of things that will begin to take place. And then they'll begin, begin the extractions, um, which are, are going to be problematic and I think we need to be prepared um, in all nations, and not just in the Navy and our Coast Guard, but you know, I'm I'm often struck as I watch the the uh, uh, crisis in the Gulf of Mexico uh, unfold, and people were saying, "Gee, why can't you go down and cap this thing at 5,000 feet?" And I was thinking of the Arctic at the time, and if we thought the that was hard in the Gulf, uh, that was junior varsity compared to a, a situation like that up in the north. So I think that's another area that we have to move, move into as that extraction begins to take place. And then our sense is that it's gonna be about 25 years before you really have a very profitable trade route uh, through the north. I think you'll see the episodic movements and, and folks will be transporting. But in 25 years time, I think you're, you, know, you will essentially cut the trade route between Asia and Europe by about a week. And I let the businessmen and the shippers uh, correct my figure of, of uh, probably at least a million dollars a voyage in savings as a result of that. So, uh, you know, that's how we see it happening as we've laid out our uh, 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 task force climate change, which has a large Arctic component. And it's not just about the Arctic. I mean, we're looking at other parts of the world where we could find frictions developing because of, of changes in, in the climate. Um, but that's the, kind of the timeline that we see it being on. 
We also know that in order to support operations, there, has, there have to be changes to ship design because even when the ice is gone, it's still going to be bloody cold up there and, and our ships are designed for a more temperate climate. So there's a lot of things and, and, and we need to start thinking about it, that and laying in the investments to meet that timeline and, and to work closely uh, here at home with the Coast Guard because we see it being a, a cooperative effort and then with our friends, uh, Canada, Norway, Russia, and other countries that have, uh, have interests up there. Yes, sir. Um, Admiral, how do you see our relationship with China emerging? They're building a large fleet to protect their trade routes. Uh, we don't know exactly what their motives are, but uh, do you see us uh, in China in a sharing role uh, to be the stewards of the sea, uh, to share those responsibilities, or do you see uh, our own Navy uh, yeah. having to be in the most dominant position? Yeah, I, I would say, um, and my relationship with the PLA Navy goes back several years. Uh, I've had the opportunity to spend uh, several occasions with my counterpart. Um, I like their characterization of their way forward as uh, the term they use are harmonious seas. I'd like to see that in practice. I'd like to see more cooperative uh, activities between us and, uh, and, and the PLA Navy. Uh, there have been some episodic events, but in my view, it's in the interests of both of our countries and both of our navies to look at ways that we can continue to cooperate. Um, I, 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 I think, to, to your point, the PLA Navy is growing as all navies of rising economic powers have grown throughout history, whether it's the United States or Britain or Portugal or Spain. But increased transparency on the part of uh, China and the PLA Navy is something that we pursue and, and uh, sometimes it goes and fits and starts. I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged uh, by some recent uh, events, but uh, the proof will be in the action. Yes, sir. Admiral uh, Charles Kogan, formerly CIA, now Kennedy School. As I understand it, all four services have units attached to the JSOC, Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force. Do you have any comments on why SEAL Team 6 was chosen to do this operation against bin Laden? Personally, I'm very happy that they were chosen, but I wondered if you had any comment on it. I don't have any comment on that at all, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <clears throat> right. Yes, sir. Um, predicting the future is always a, a challenge. Uh, I do believe that we are moving into uh, a, a period that will be characterized with disorder. Um, your comment about w will we in be involved in a war, I don't know. Um, I do believe that as uh, a, a nation that uh, continues to be the global leader, and I don't say that arrogantly, um, that our presence, our involvement in these areas of disorder will be called upon to bring order to that space. I think that's what will be in our future. You would expect me as a navalist to say that the best way to do that is uh, with a global fleet, a forward fleet, uh, and when I talk about the forward fleet, I talk about not just the Navy, but the Marine Corps, because I really do think that the future will be one that will be continuously characterized by sensitivities with respect to sovereignty. And, and that the Navy and Marine Corps, because of how we can move, because of how we can regulate distance and size in ways that 
is, are really, uh, uh, they, that they can't be observed, that we will be a force that will be called upon to be present. Uh, and, and I think as we look at the, at the future and we conduct strategic reviews and we come to grips with what are real economic and budgetary issues, uh, that we have to think about what we want our military to be able to do, how we want to do it, and, and I think that there's great value in a Navy and Marine Corps that's forward, that's agile, uh, and that can reconstitute itself and reshape itself to deal with the, uh, with the needs as they arise. Because I do think there will be a period of change and pressure and, and potentially friction. I think that I'm, I'm struck as I look around, and I mentioned our task force climate change. When you look at the demographics of the world, the compression into the littorals, uh, the fact that most of the megacities are littoral cities, uh, the fact that as we see the ice melt in the Arctic, uh, are, are we also going to be experiencing sea level rises? And are we going to even see some of these megacities actually begin to drop down a little bit? And so, you know, what effect does that have? What are the frictions that that pose? Not even to begin a discussion about um, water. And I think that in the future, whereas today uh, people would not be surprised if countries went to war for energy, I think in the future there'll be water wars. Uh, some argue that that's of such a significant, uh, that's such a significant staple, not even a staple of necessity, um, that people will work it out. I'm not so sure. There will be friction. And so as we look at uh, the globe with our task force climate change, where do we think those frictions will occur? Where do we think the problems will occur? And then what does that mean for how we as a Navy want to be designed, and then how do we operate it? I hope that got to your question. I'm going to work this side here for a little bit. Admiral, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Fred Kobrick, Sudbury, Mass. Uh, some of us remember in detail in 1973 during the Vietnam War that the Arab oil embargo reached the point where our carriers were having trouble uh, being able to get enough fuel to refuel our planes to fight that war. And uh, Henry Kissinger has told some people over time how we negotiated our way out of that. Now, we don't always know that we can negotiate ourselves out of something as serious as our carriers being able to get enough fuel to refuel the jets. We also know that there's a great sensitivity with Iran these days, and the big threat there is if they try to close the Straits of Hormuz. We also know that China has developed a missile called the Carrier Killer because they're not happy with us dominating their waters. So if we had a confluence of events, and that could be deliberate on the parts of our enemies, um, at a time of budget cu cutting, what kind of non-secret strategic thinking would make us feel that these kind of things that have happened before are things that you're all talking about and feel, do you feel confident that we would be prepared for something like 1973? Yeah, um, great question, thank you. Uh, and I'm old enough to remember 1973. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, I, I think um, you would, you would be pleased with the types of discussions that are taking place, but as you talked about the two areas of interest, particularly the Western Pacific and the, uh, um, and the Middle East, what I would offer is uh, if, if you haven't had the opportunity to read our maritime strategy, it was issued three and a half years ago, um, and it identifies the two areas of primary interest for the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard um, to, to be the Western Pacific, the Arabian Gulf, and, and the Indian Ocean region. Because we believe that that's where the economies of the world are going to be fueled and where there is potential for friction. Uh, and that thinking is not inconsistent with a lot of the planning uh, that, that goes on beyond the Navy and Marine Corps. 
much of that planning goes on in a more classified vein. But, but I think the, the, that there's no question that those are two primary areas. That does not mean that we neglect uh, other areas. Uh, for example, we, in the last couple of years since we issued the maritime strategy, even though we highlighted those two areas, we've spent more time in Africa than we have uh, in any time in the past. Our involvement in uh, South and Central America is also, uh, also continues. But we really do think that those are the two areas. Our investments in the capabilities that, that we have are focused on trends that are taking place, uh, military trends that are taking place. And the difference, I would say, between now and 1973 is that you could do your planning, your military planning, based on what you saw states developing. And it was a nice, you know, you could do things by flags, if you will. But I think that one of the things that has happened over the past couple of decades that makes it a bit more difficult for planners and, and, and those thinking about the future is how pro proliferation has gone beyond states. And you are now able to see some fairly sophisticated systems uh, in non-state uh, actors' hands. And so I think, you know, you, while we focus on those areas, uh, we have to be mindful of other places uh, and, and also to, to try to look into that future and, and see where some future friction points can be. Yes, sir. Admiral Joe Strasser. Good to see you, uh, thank you. You, at the beginning of your remarks, talked about the uh, op-tempo of our ships and the personnel, and then cited a couple of examples recently where we have been on the spot and able to react in crises because mm -hmm. we were there. Uh, given this high op-tempo that we have now, how are we doing with both the availability and the finances to do the required maintenance uh, on our ships make sure that when we really need them that they're ready to go. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Joe, and great to see you again. Um, I, I would say the area that we're most pressed on probably is time. Uh, we, in the last couple of years, have been somewhat successful in, in increasing our operation and maintenance accounts. Uh, we worked hard the last couple of years. Bill Burke and his folks were able to really put together some very compelling uh, reasons why that was required, but time is 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 the issue now, uh, and and in finding the time to be able to get that longer term maintenance. The other thing that we did uh, a while back um, that we're walking away from is we had gotten away, and and not to bore, you know, the non-engineers. Um, we had had a very very good way of doing what we call life cycle engineering. In other words, when we buy a major capital asset like a ship and we wanted to get it to 30, 35 years, you have to, you have to plan and do maintenance uh, in, a, in a fairly disciplined way. We had walked away from that and we were doing maintenance to get them out the door for the next deployment and it started to catch up with us. We've reinvested. We now are doing that again uh, with the eye toward getting, getting the fleet to the end of its service life. But we are pushing it hard and uh, we're looking at ways that how that deployment model could be shaped or changed. Uh, but the demand is there and, uh, and, and, our, and our people uh, continue to do great work uh, uh, like the other services, but, but we're failing it pretty acutely. We have uh, an excess retention problem right now. Uh, when you go back to the 70s, there were, uh, the retention levels were really pretty mm -hmm. low. Uh, so we don't have the problem with people that we had back in, in the 70s. I was going over some data the other day. Uh, first term retention for sailors back in the 70s was 16%. Um, we're running at over 72% right now. Uh, and in fact, regrettably, this summer we're going to have to ask, uh, or not ask, but rather uh, cause 3,000 sailors to leave the Navy before they want to. That's how high our retention levels are. Yes, sir. Admiral Paul Daly from Boston. Uh, first, thank you for taking the time to come and speak with us and to be 
this candidate in the q and A. I, I'd like to follow up on Admiral Strasser's question. As you talk about a deployed Navy, 46% deployed today, in the future it's going to be a deployed Navy, a Navy. All of these places are a long way from the states. My question is, with the number of ships that I see coming out of commission, and the few ships that I see being authorized by Congress to build, over the next five to 10 years, what does the Navy look like to be able to accomplish that maritime strategy? And secondly, how do you fund that Navy uh, considering the deficit we have yeah. today? Oh, uh, thanks for the question. The, I think one of the things that we've been able to do um, in, in the fleet um, is to inject uh, stability into our production lines. The, there was no question that when I came into this job that we were going to see a downturn. I mean, if you look at defense budgets over time, there's, they're a pretty nice cycle. I mean, it's very predictable. The, the one that we're in right now is what I call an inflated high for much longer than it has ever been before. And that was a pretty good indication that things were going to turn down. And um, I will tell you that the severity of the economic pressures that we're feeling, I didn't quite see it that way, but uh, I don't think I'm the Lone Ranger in that regard. But the, so we saw it coming down, and it was important that we got stability, because with stability comes predictability and come efficiencies as you try to build force structure. And if you look in our submarine force, for example, this year we've gone to two Virginias a year. We got the price down to where we wanted it, two Virginias a year this year. In the surface Navy, uh, right before Christmas, we got the green light from Congress to do a block buy of 20 littoral combat ships, and they are important to forward presence, particularly in areas of maritime security. And they're perfect for operating in the types of areas that I think are going to be key to making sure that the resource flows are good, whether they're operating in the Arabian Gulf, Straits of Hormuz, the Bab el Mandeb, uh, whether they're uh, in the South China Sea, I think these ships are, excuse me, are going to be extraordinarily valuable. And the, and the deployment model that we're going to use on them is very different than what we have with our ships today, where there's one crew, one ship. Uh, the plan is for us to have. Um, three crews for two ships with one ship forward all the time, and those crews move among them. So that's going to be important. We're, we have restarted the, the uh, uh, Arleigh Burke guided missile destroyer line because that's the workhorse of ballistic missile defense, and that's among our, our conventional force, that's the force that's going to get stressed the most because of missile defense requirements in the Western Pacific, the Middle East, and now in the Mediterranean because we've just started the phased adaptive approach. So, but with the, the beauty of going with the Arleigh Burke class is not only are we building a like ship with a lot of economies in there, but we're also able to go back and upgrade the previous ships of the class to ballistic missile defense capability. And in this budget that we've submitted, we're gonna go from 21 BMD DDGs, guided missile destroyers, to 41 in the period of this budget. So we're ramping that up, and that will alleviate some of the churn on the, on the force. The area that I think is, is uh, the most exciting for a young person coming in the Navy today is naval aviation. We are renewing naval aviation. Uh, we're still buying the Hornets, Super Hornets. Uh, in fact, we have a buy, uh, an authorization that'll be about 50. Uh, JSF, we're moving on that. The new maritime patrol airplane is in test. The new airborne early warning airplane is uh, in a squadron in Norfolk, Virginia right now. Helicopter lines are solid. So I think that, that, that as we have to deal with budget pressures, the advantage that we have in the Navy right now, stable lines that we can get good economies out of, and these are the types of things that are going to uh, pay dividends operating forward. Yes, sir. Admiral, I was excited to see in the maritime strategy the statement that preventing wars is best as mm -hmm. preventing wars. Does this seem to be an important doctrinal step toward combining conflict prevention and avoidance with two other legs of the strategic triad, conflict resolution and non-provocative defense, which would provide you um, defeat and deter aggression? 
I, I think, um, you know, for those of us that have been doing this for a while, uh, that's always our first objective, is, is to prevent anything from flashing. And, um, and as we developed the maritime strategy, we did put in a very strong statement about prevention being key, and that's the genesis for a lot of the activities that we undertake um, working with friends and partners around the world. And, and quite frankly, it's not simply the ships that are sailing out on the, uh, uh, out in the ocean, but it's, uh, uh, it, it, it takes place as much in, in, in this institution as, as anywhere else, where we bring leaders, international leaders, rising leaders together uh, to develop a better understanding, develop the types of relationships that, that can prevent conflict in the future. So I think that's going to continue to drive us, but I will also say that uh, the nation has a navy that when that prevention doesn't work, then we're ready to go to work and we will prevail. And so that's part of the design of the fleet that we have today as well. And as we look at, at developments around the world, and as I mentioned earlier, not just focused on any particular state because that technology moves and we have to be ready to counter it wherever it may be. And if we can counter it and there's a credible counter to that, then I think you have a better chance of, of not having a conflict. Yes, sir. Jonathan Shannon, Torrington, Connecticut. Um, the provision of security for the energy supply lines is not captured in the price of fuel at the pump. Um, it's an externality, and when you have externalities, you tend to consume more of something than you would otherwise. In order to have a mature discussion about um, internalizing this externality and, and having a, a, an appropriate level of energy consumption in the United States, we need to know what the military really spends on this mission. Uh, the last study which I think tried to quantify this was in 1992 and 1993 by the GOA. There's been a couple of studies, including a RAND study from a few years ago, but the estimates are all over the place. 20% to 60% of the defense budget goes to energy security. Uh, do you have an estimate of what this number would be, and will the Navy ever attempt to find out what the number is? Yeah, I, um, I, I do not have uh, that. I, quite frankly, have not thought about it in those terms. I'm sure that um, you could probably bring different groups together, and you'd get a range of, uh, of, of, what, of what that is that, that goes toward, toward energy security. Um, but it's a great question, and I'll turn it over to my staff to figure out. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Admiral uh, <clears throat> Ed Romovich, Hollywood, Florida. How comfortable or uncomfortable are you with the events in Bahrain? How comfortable I am with the events in Bahrain? Um, I think that um, as we look at the events that have taken place there, and and anyone who wears this uniform has a relationship with Bahrain that is uh, pretty unique. Uh, we've been operating there for a long time. It's been the home of our fifth fleet. Uh, we have a relationship with the people there, indeed with the leadership there. Um, and, and I think all of us would, would say that, um, uh, that, that some of the violence that was visited on the people of Bahrain uh, you know, was extraordinarily unfortunate. That said, I believe it quelled and, and there's a commitment to resolve the differences. None of the activity that took place in Bahrain was directed against um, uh, Westerners. None was directed against uh, our Fifth Fleet personnel and the missions that we accomplished there. But uh, we're all very uh, hopeful and very supportive of a dialogue that can take place uh, within the kingdom to, uh, to move the kingdom into the future. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Admiral. Lieutenant Commander Adam Hudson, Naval War College student. My question is, with many of our allies reducing their naval forces due to budgetary constraints, um, with the limited resource and ever increasing demand for these resources, do you foresee the global community expecting more or less from the United States Navy with regards to respond to these global conflicts? Yeah, thanks. I, I would say that I don't see any change in the demand 
for our Navy. Uh, I think that the countries that are reducing uh, their force structure in conversations that I've had with my counterparts, even though their force structure is being reduced, they're looking anew at how they can take what they have and, and better integrate uh, with us, and, and I'm doing the same thing. How can we uh, support them as they go through, uh, you know, some of their, you know, their tough times? Because we really do gain more, uh, e even with their contributions, with their perspectives, perhaps with some of the access that they may have. And so uh, I think we're going to stay at a fairly high demand level, uh, and that it's incumbent on us to work with uh, navies and other militaries as they reshape to see, okay, there's been a change. How do we accommodate that change uh, to be able to uh, accomplish a common, common objective? And so you know, that's what we, what we have to do. Um, in fact, I'm headed over to Europe here at the end of the week to meet with a counterpart over there to kind of look into that crystal ball and see what, uh, what the future may hold, but to do it in a positive way. And I mean, it's very easy to say, well, you've taken this out, therefore, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't have that at my disposal or at our disposal. I think what we have to do is say, okay, that's a reality. What do we do? What do you have? How do we work together? And, uh, and then see where it takes us. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Former Czech Secretary Don Rumsfeld observed that our institutions are very good at incremental change, but not as good at transformative change. What have you observed in your leadership time um, in making more transformational changes? Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I think that what, uh, what I have observed is that, that we can move quickly, and I'll use an example of what we did in the Navy. Uh, there was no question that I think we're in a different environment um, operationally and technologically. Uh, if you look at the Navy over time, we really have been dominated by um, um, I'm going to use the term, no offense to my brethren in this uniform, uh, tribes. Uh, we have submarines and ships and airplanes. And, and, and that's a pretty powerful group of people. It's how we all grew up. It's what we believe in. It's how we've defined ourselves, if you will. But we live in a world where, uh, in my opinion, information is king and how that information is used, how it's distributed, how it's sensed, how it's analyzed, will be the driving factor in the future. So about two and a half years ago, we made a change within the Navy uh, that made what we're calling information dominance more central to how we do things. We reactivated, uh, stood up, if you will, uh, uh, an organization that we call the U.S. 10th Fleet. It was last used in World War II. Uh, that became our global cyber fleet. And then we took all of the people who are involved in information and created a, what we call an information dominance core, 45,000 people. Uh, we made that shift in a period of about six months, and it has really changed how we look at things. I would also say that if you look at what has transpired in the last couple of years and how we have placed um, um, energy in the forefront of, uh, of our thinking is, is pretty transformational as a, as a, as a service goes. And, and I see uh, folks here from uh, uh, our Office of Naval Research and, and, and looking at ways to bring that new technology in pretty quickly uh, we've injected uh, a, a lot into that. I would say, though, uh, being very blunt, that uh, we still are a fairly large bureaucratic organization and bureaucracies like process. And I think that in some of our acquisition efforts, uh, the process that we put ourselves through, um, a testing program that uh, does not 
uh, like to see any failure is actually an inhibitor to moving forward. Uh, I do believe that in order to achieve breakthrough uh, successes, failure is a good thing from time to time. And so I think that, that we've gotten ourselves into too much of a bureaucratic uh, structure process that we're not moving as quickly as, uh, as we'd like to. Uh, for example, uh, we in the Navy have an objective to put a squadron of unmanned aircraft on an aircraft carrier by 2018. Uh, we just took a congressional mark that told us to slow down. Um, I'd like to see what would have happened had when President Kennedy said before the end of the decade we're going to put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth if somebody had said, Mr. President, slow down. Uh, I think in a way that we're losing our sense of adventure, uh, our sense of exploration, um, and a willingness to move fast. Apologize for the editorial comment. That's the way I feel about it. Yes, sir. I'm on Nick Fellner, in New Canaan, Connecticut. As a former naval aviator and father of a naval aviator, I was very interested in your comment about the naval, future of naval aviation. I believe I've heard that recently uh, there is a, in pilot stage, a drone that will not only take off but also land on a carrier. Given this potential technology, how do you see the future training of naval aviators and the demand for them. Thank you very much. Um, I think that when we think about unmanned systems, whether they're airplanes, surface ships, or submarines, um, that to me it's not an either or. I think if we think of uh, manned and, and unmanned, um, you know, we tend to get into this, uh, this either or. And I really believe that we have the potential to bring the manned and unmanned together, <clears throat> and if we do, the, the, do it in the right way, then we can be a much more effective force. Where we are with the unmanned uh, aircraft, we have flown the, uh, the airplane that we intend to, to test on board a carrier here shortly. It, we've, we've had uh, three flights of it. We're getting ready to fly the second prototype here pretty soon, um, and it, they were extraordinary uh, flights, by the way. Uh, we have in, uh, in a Hornet and in a King Air, we have the control systems that will be going out to an aircraft carrier uh, to work in that dense electromagnetic environment and, and to actually use the, the landing process. Um, but where we are right now, and particularly where we are on the front end of a whole new uh, type of airplane, whether it's the Joint Strike Fighter the P-8, the new maritime patrol uh, airplane, the replacement for the P-3, we're going to be in manned aviation uh, for at least the next generation. Uh, and that I think the unmanned aircraft will be used for the dull and the dangerous uh, missions uh, that, that, that is just not uh, optimized to a human being. And so I think that's the way that it will go. We still have a long way to go before an unmanned airplane is ever going to be used as a fighter, simply because of the nature of the artificial intelligence that has to go into it. So I think that we have a good plan in the Navy as we bridge our tactical aviation fleet with Super Hornets. We're bringing in the new Joint Strike Fighter, and then we're starting as aggressively as we possibly can to get to the point where, where we bring in the unmanned uh, in a way to, to keep the human being out of the dull and the dangerous. Yes, sir. I'll repeat. That's okay. Here we go. My question, uh, since we are at an educational institution, it's about education. The Chinese probably turn out for every engineer we have 20, 30. Many of them, not China, but many of the students here at RPI, MIT, they estimate 40, 50 percent is ed educated here and go back. My concern is, do you feel secure 
in our educational system that you will be able to bring in those young people, particularly the ones engineers technologically superior, that will be able to maintain what we now have is a cyber, electronic, et cetera, uh, Navy that we need. Uh, thank you for a great last question. <laughs> because I'm going to turn it around on you. That's no, no. Because I'm going to turn it around on you. 28% um, of the youth in America qualify for military service. Qualify for military service. That doesn't mean the talent that we want, the science, technology, engineering, math, is in that 28%. Um, in the Navy, we have been working, uh, we kind of started out uh, thinking about the high school. Wrong place. Um, so we've started to migrate a lot of our outreach down into uh, the middle school to uh, go out and talk to young men and women about the benefits and the fulfillment you get from doing this. Um, it's amazing because I think most of us in the room grew up within earshot of fathers, and in this case the example is all men, fathers and uncles who we could hear their stories of World War II or Korea, maybe even Vietnam. And that, that planted uh, uh, something in us that we were aware uh, of the service, of the respect and the special place that this uh, serving in uniform had for that particular generation. Those conversations tend not to take place in the country today because it's a very smaller military, uh, very focused military. And, and I was struck, there's a, there's a school, anybody here from the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area? Uh, there's a great school there, uh, uh, Dubisky High, that is an incredible education model. And I had a young woman taking me around who I thought was a member of the faculty. She was a junior in high school. <laughs> she had the poise, the drive, the knowledge. Um, and, and, and the aspiration uh, of, of an adult. She was a junior in high school. Her question to me was, can you be an engineer in the Navy? Um, and so I would submit that we can talk about our educational system, we can talk about the fact that maybe the young people aren't coming to the military the way that we would like them to, but in a way, it's not their fault. And I would submit that as we go back out to wherever it may be uh, to find those young people, uh, to work with groups that inspire young people to get into science, technology, engineering, and math. And if you can get them to come in the Navy, I'm all for it. But if you can get them to go work for NASA or the Department of Energy or any place where they can bring their minds to bear to move us ahead technologically, scientifically, in the domain of engineering, that that's the best investment any of us could possibly do. And so I would say that that's our charge um, because the, the young people today are terrific. If you ever doubt that, come to me with a to a nuclear submarine or an aircraft carrier. These are the young men and women that come from our country. The problem we have is that there are many more like them out there that don't know who we are. And we have to go and make them aware of the opportunities and the value and the fulfillment that comes from serving for even a short period of time. They're out there, there are so many great examples, and I would encourage you to do that because we will need them, not just in the Navy, not just in our military, but as a nation if we want to maintain a position of leadership in the world of the future. So I thank you very much. Again, I apologize, uh, and I really regret not being able to stay because I think this forum is going to be terrific. Uh, I know the Secretary is very much uh, looking forward uh, to being here and sharing his thoughts with you, um, and I hope that the questions you give him are as challenging as the ones that you gave me. Thank you very much. Thank you.